Hello, my dears. We haven't done a sciencey video on this channel in a while, and y'all know how much I just love reading academic articles. Um, I have to make use of my psych degree and my medical trauma somewhere, right? Anyway, welcome to Dopamine Doesn't Work Like That. I'm anticipating this may become a series because there is also Vitamin D Doesn't Work Like That, um, Serotonin Doesn't Work Like That, also the whole cult of trauma explaining every single human behavior somehow. Like, I don't know. What if you get overwhelmed in big cities because big cities are overwhelming and not because a specific sentence somebody said to you at age three that you don't remember made you permanently terrified of cities? Or like, have you all seen a thing that's like, oh, if you could differentiate the footsteps of everybody in your household, you grew up in an abusive household. And I'm like, or what if you just pay attention? Anyway, I keep being told that I like rock climbing because I have ADHD, which means I have low dopamine and rock climbing is a high dopamine sport. And so it feels particularly rejuvenating for me due to my neurotype. And every time that somebody says this to me, which has been six or seven times in the last couple months, I always think to myself, you know, I haven't looked into that, but like based on intro psychology alone, I'm 99% sure that's not how that works, but I never say anything. Um, but I decided to finally look into it and now we're here. Also, if you're new here, hi there, hello. My name is Sydney. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an openly queer, artistic, trans, non-binary actor, composer, educator, and disability advocate. I'm a white person with light brown shoulder length curly hair. I'm wearing a black t-shirt with a open button up on top that is like mustard yellow and has brown and white flowers, leaves, things on it. And I'm sitting in front of a uh, plain wall that has green leaves hanging on it. Um, also, if you want to stick around, you definitely can. You're super welcome here. Um, if you don't, that's also chill, no pressure. And if debunking popular science interests you, I have a playlist about that linked up here. Also, I want to give a quick source shout out because I leaned very heavily on two particular lovely folks research while making this video, um, Dr. Devin Price and Jesse Meadows, both incredible writers and scholars and talk a lot about understanding mental illness within a political lens and what our scientific language is being used for. And I cannot recommend their work enough if you're not familiar with them yet. As always, all of my sources are in the description below and you should check all of them out. But specifically, the two of them are incredible and are very much the basis of this video. So I wanted to shout them out. Alrighty, let's dive into this. Also, content warnings. Uh, for mentions of addictions, probably mentions of food, not majorly in eating disorder territory, but like mentions of controlling food input may be triggering to some folks. Um, but yeah, Great. Okay. So I think we've all heard that dopamine is the pleasure chemical. I think we all have one friend with either a dopamine molecule as a tattoo or a necklace. And if you've been anywhere near the ADHD side of TikTok, the wellness side of TikTok, or the finance bro side of TikTok, you've probably seen something or other about how social media is addictive because it gives us too much artificial and cheap dopamine and it overloads our system, which makes us unable to properly feel real and natural dopamine that comes from things like exercise and sleep and friends and sunshine and stuff. And therefore dopamine fasting is important because it resets our systems with the underlying assumption being that dopamine is addictive and we need to work hard to gain control over it because living in an inherently pleasure seeking way gets in the way of your ability to reach your full potential. Dopamine fasting usually looks like not eating junk food, not checking your social media right when you wake up, limiting your social media time, going out on a walk, scheduling quiet time into your day. And that resets your dopamine receptors something, reset something to do with dopamine, and then you feel better. Uh, my initial thoughts have always been like, wow, it's almost like taking care of your body mind makes you feel more relaxed and put together. So why is dopamine involved here? That feels like an unnecessary extra step. But you know what? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. In 1954, James Olds and Peter Milner did a study. Basically, they had some rats and they put some electrodes into the brains of the rats and they put them in a classic scanner box where they were able to press a lever. The, the rats were able to press a lever, not the humans, to stimulate the electrodes in their own brain. And via this, they discovered that there is one particular location in the brain that the rats repeatedly stimulated themselves. So so Olds and Milner concluded that this must be the central location where pleasure takes place in the brain. And in 1958, a Swedish pharmacologist named Arvid Carlson showed that dopamine, which had been discovered to be present in the brain a year before, was a neurotransmitter and where in the brain one can find it. He was super cool. Um, his research is the reason we have most mental health medications and is kind of the foundation for Parkinson's research. He also won a Nobel Prize in 2000. Anyway, he's cool. Look into him. But in the 60s and 70s, there was enough knowledge from these two studies that dopamine existed and that it existed primarily in what was seen as the pleasure center of the brain. So when the war on drugs came around in the 70s and 80s, there was a quest to find some sort of neurological basis for addiction. That's when all of these pieces got put together, which is where we get 
dopamine is the pleasure chemical and dopamine is responsible for addiction from. There were many studies about how drugs cause an excess amount of dopamine in our brains, which our brains cope with by making less dopamine organically by themselves, building up a sort of tolerance that requires more and more of that drug to get the same hit, creating a dependence on it, which also results in withdrawals when not using the drug. There was also a hypothesis about depression, saying that people with clinical depression have low levels of brain dopamine and therefore they enjoy life less because of it. That has been pretty much deep the addiction stuff is correct in that we see those things happening in the brain in association with what's going on, but the discussions of cause and effect have very much changed in recent history. At the time, the poster child for dopamine was the cocaine rat, which is the one that sat there all day every day in its little skitter box, hitting the lever over and over again to get its next hit of a drug. Which takes us to the discussion from my chemical imbalance video. I've reused this clip in at least two or three other videos as well on this channel, but you know what? It's a good one. So going to include it here, talk about issues of why drug research from that era was kind of inherently skewed, and then we're going to talk more about what we know now about dopamine. So. Take it away, Sydney from two years ago who did not know how to focus a camera for some reason. Now, luckily, at the time that I ended up in this scientific rabbit hole, I was also in the middle of a book for one of my neuro classes, and it really added a lot to the way that I was thinking about mental illness. It is called High Price by Dr. Carl Hart, and I would show it, but it's over there and I'm not going to go get it right now. Um, but it is genuinely one of the best books that I've ever read. He is a leading researcher in addiction in our country, um, and this is his autobiography where he analyzes his experiences of growing up in the ghetto through the beginning of the crack epidemic and analyzing all of that through the lens of a behavioral scientist. And it's really cool and it's really interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Please go read it right now. There's also an audiobook, which is really great. Um, I'll link one of his talks in the description if you just want to watch him speak. Super great. But anyway, in this book, he kind of pulled apart some of the most widely regarded studies about addiction that we tend to look at and the flaws within their setup and results and how those results were interpreted. Because I think that the mental illness that we've been most told has genetic predispositions is addiction and how even if you just try a drug once, you're going to get addicted forever if there's any addiction in your family tree. Even though studies have actually shown that the vast majority of drug users aren't addicted and are well employed and are living normal lives, they just use them occasionally recreationally. He also talked about one of the most commonly cited studies about addiction where a rat or maybe it's a mouse either way a small fuzzy thing um, was given a lever to press for a dose of cocaine and these mice rats would continue hitting the lever over and over again trying to get more and more cocaine until they ultimately died and these results were then used to say well if people start using cocaine then they'll get addicted and drug crazy and keep consuming more and more and more until they die without any self-control but the thing is if you give that animal another option, like sugar water or something, they're going to switch evenly between the two things, which goes against that theory that they're so addicted that they would do anything for that drug. And then if you give them a mate, they typically ignore the drug entirely. If they get their own little mouse rat city with proper socialization like they'd experience typically in the wild, very few mice rats actually ever use the drug. So clearly addiction is not a, this drug will ruin your life the second you touch it because your genes are messed up thing. It's more related to what environment you're actually in. Dr. Hart also did some studies with frequent drug users, some with meth and others with cocaine, where if offered the drug or $5 and they could pick one of the two options, half the time they would go for the $5 despite being given literal free drugs. So that goes against all of these ideas that people become addicted and are drug crazed and can't make responsible decisions and only focus on the next time they're gonna get a hit like every other study and pop culture has claimed. So why does society convince us that all of this research says otherwise? Well, it's because the majority of drug research in our country gets funding from the bills that were part of the war on drugs, where they were expected to research drugs and come up with some sort of results saying that drugs were a danger and that we should be incarcerating everybody who even possesses them. And if they didn't come up with those results, they would lose their funding and therefore their jobs. And I don't think we really need to go into the thinly veiled racism behind the war on drugs because we talked about this in my eugenics video, but it makes sense that these are the narratives that we're getting. And since they're more sensational than, you know, the drugs for recreational use don't actually ruin the lives of the vast majority of people and they're not really a problem, these are the stories that stick in our brains. He also talked about studies that compared the brain scans of drug users and those with non-users and how the results were basically taking any difference between the brains and calling it brain damage and cognitive deficits that were 
in the brains of the drug users caused by that drug, despite the majority of those differences being kind of reasonably typical variation in human brain structure. A 2007 study by Kent Barrett showed that dopamine is not the pleasure chemical, but in fact the reward chemical, more focused on wanting to do something and the anticipation of the thing than liking the thing when it is happening. There is no pleasure chemical because pleasure is a concept, it's very complicated, and almost definitely includes tons of different chemical processes in the brain. Dopamine is also involved in regulating motor function, lactation, motivation, emotional arousal, goal setting, attention, working memory, and avoidance. Studies have shown that low levels of dopamine don't mean that a person likes a thing less. You can in fact very much like a thing without any dopamine at all. It's that they're less motivated to work for that thing, which is why stimulants like amphetamine make people more productive. It increases the dopamine, which increases the motivation to do the things. If we are looking forward to something, dopamine gets released, and if the reward is uncertain, even more dopamine gets released. Um, because because there's increased anticipation. This is how gambling is structured and how social media algorithms were created. We're gonna pause and talk about conditioning for a hot second. I'm gonna, oh dear, I'm gonna scoot over for this because we're gonna need some tables here. Classical conditioning is kind of step one. That's the Pavlov stuff. You know, if you feed your dog every time you ring the bell, they hear the bell, they expect the food. That's fine until the bell gets used in some commercial on TV and then your dog starts howling because he thinks it means it's food time because he heard a bell. That's super simple, super basic association. Then we have operant conditioning. They're basically the four kinds that we usually organize into a little table, which you can see here, with reinforcement and punishment on the left, and then positive and negative on the top. The top row, or I guess technically the middle row of this, is the types of reinforcement which increase a behavior, and then the bottom row are types of punishment which decrease a behavior. Positive reinforcement is when you add an appetitive to increase the behavior. For example, if your dog goes to the bathroom outside, they get a treat. Then there's negative reinforcement, which is removing an aversive to increase the behavior. Like, I don't know, screaming continuously until your dog goes outside and then no longer screaming once they've gone to the bathroom outside, which makes no sense, but you get the idea. Positive punishment is when you add an aversive to decrease a behavior. For example, yelling at your dog for having an accident. And then negative punishment is removing an appetitive to decrease behavior. For example, if they have an accident, you take away their food bowl. These all train various behaviors. If you're an animal trainer, you know that positive reinforcement is really the only ethical and also the most effective of these options, but they all exist exist. The second half of a condition is the intervals or ratios at which conditioning takes place, to which we get another table. This one has the type of schedule on the left divided into fixed and variable, and on the top it has the two types of spacing divided into interval, meaning time, and ratio, meaning number. So a fixed interval reward would mean that every 30 minutes you work you get a snack break. A fixed ratio reward would be like every five coffees you get, you get a free donut. A variable interval is like studying for a pop quiz where you know that at some point in the next period of time there will be a pop quiz, but you're not sure when, so you need to study constantly, and variable ratio would be like a slot machine where one of these tries you just might get the jackpot. Variable schedules are harder to extinguish than fixed schedules because you never know when the thing is going to happen. There's always a chance the thing could happen. With a fixed schedule, if every five you stop getting the thing, you lose interest and anticipation pretty quickly. But a schedule where you have no idea when the reward is going to strike, like gambling, or I don't know which video of mine is going to be the one that goes viral, or the random intervals at which you get notified about likes on Instagram, that keeps you guessing and coming back for more. So yes, dopamine is involved here in that it is related to motivation and anticipation, but it's a whole lot more complicated than just like, ah yes, dopamine controlled brain. There is a lot more going on. Specifically looking back at addiction, we know that stimulants such as amphetamines produce a release in dopamine. This is well researched. There's also semi-decent evidence that alcohol also does, both of which can be addictive substances. But stimulants seen as less addictive, such as Ritalin and Modafinil, also cause a large dopamine release. The evidence as to whether that is the case for THC, ketamine, and nicotine is more or less a toss-up, with about half of the studies saying that there is significant release and the other half saying that there isn't at all. Also a reminder that something being statistically significant could mean 2% over the average and not like, wow, this is a noticeable difference. Studies on other addictive things such as junk food and video games have found small dopamine release increases, but these studies are both very small and very poorly replicated. We also know that dopamine releasing in anticipation is not always related to positive things either, furthering the this is not the pleasure chemical. Um, triggering things in people with PTSD trigger large dopamine releases. After a major stressor for an animal, we see dopamine spikes as well, which is a great example as to how some processes may look exactly the same on a brain scan, but feel completely different to the individual experience. 
experiencing them. There are also so many stories about our imaging software doing funky things that makes us think that there are statistically significant differences when in fact it's just a consistent glare or something else entirely going on. And there's something to be said about the fact that just because a mental process has a specific biological marker that we can point out and go, oh look, this is happening, that doesn't mean that said thing is caused by that biological marker. The brain is a biological structure. The mind is a process expressed by that brain. Whether you're studying the neuroscience of attitude change, love, fear, daydreaming, listening to music, or reading about Batman on Wikipedia, you're always going to find biological processes that are involved. That doesn't mean there is a reading about Batman on Wikipedia chemical or a listening to synth pop lobe of the brain. It simply means that all human mental processes occur via the brain. And tying this back into the chemical imbalance myth of mental illness, i.e. your brain has less dopamine and that has caused your ADHD, things are a lot more complicated than that. Like yes, ADHDers typically exhibit less dopamine release than non-ADHDers and therefore struggle with motivation and executive functioning. Though the discussion around how much that is actually majorly the case in a literal sense or whether that's more metaphorical because it's hard to measure amounts of dopamine in the brain is a whole thing. I don't feel quite qualified to get into that right now, but just saying. Whether our brains have less dopamine release and therefore we are less motivated to make ourselves do stuff, or those things are not motivating to us so we cannot process the dopamine to make ourselves do them, is a very important distinction that we don't entirely understand. Outside reality impacts inside chemicals, and sometimes inside chemicals impact how we see outside reality, but it is not one thing or another because humans are very much related to our environments and vice versa. And there's also a lot of discussion about how conceptually different kinds of motivators work better for ADHD, specifically social motivators like, hey, I'm gonna do this thing in the same room as you do that thing. In a society that requires an individual to be able to motivate themselves to do things because it is seen as unproductive to require the help of others to complete daily tasks. Which is why, for me, things such as I promised my hiking boots we would go out on a walk today and I can't let them down, or I need to get this video done on time because I know people are counting on a weekly video, works better for me than, hey self, I'm gonna go on a walk today, or I'm gonna get this video done when it needs to get done. I create my own outside motivation because I cannot make it work internally and that triggers my ability to do those things. And a lot of what we see with this dopamine discussion on social media and at business conferences and whatnot is a focus on like, you need to force yourself to stop doing things that you like and that are fun, that distract you from your current reality because that's preventing you from reaching your full potential. And it's your inner moral failing, which we now lean more into like, it's your brain chemical failing and you need to learn how to get control over your brain chemicals somehow because we like making things sound scientific, that is preventing you from being able to fully engage with the world. Not the fact that maybe your constant need to be on social media is because you don't see your friends very often and it's the only time you get to interact with them. Or that maybe somebody likes to do a drug every once in a while or play video games a few hours a day because it gives them an escape from what's going on in the wider world. And there's nothing wrong with that. The concept of dopamine fasting puts the onus of, wow, society sucks, on the individual's response to society sucking and makes you feel ashamed for not being 100% productive all the time in the way that is deemed productive and positive under capitalism. And a lot of discussions that I've read about addiction in regard to things like video games or junk food or social media are based in research showing that most people who say they are addicted to these things are not actually technically addicted to them, but instead ashamed of wanting to partake in those things, of finding joy in those things, of having those things as part of their life. And therefore that shame in relation to that is actually what is causing struggles in their daily life and not the fact that they are partaking in those activities. And then for other things that are genuinely 100% addictions, these often point to wider societal struggles and a response to environment and circumstance, which Dr. Carl Hart has shown extensively with his research. At the end of the day, most of the things that are villainized as being cheap dopamine are the same puritanical moral panic war on drug stuff we've been decrying as society for forever, just repackaged under a new pseudoscientific label. Avoiding social media for a bit is relaxing because social media is very overwhelming and very overstimulating and there is so much going on. So you avoiding it is just reducing stress. Watching what you're eating is relaxing because your body needs nutrients to survive and eating only a donut for an entire day is not enough to get you through. Spending quiet time in nature, taking the time to sit and journal, those things are relaxing because they are reducing stimulation and increasing introspection and listening to your body and not taking life at 100 miles per hour all the time. I guarantee you that that dopamine is totally involved somewhere because it's a part of your brain that is involved in most of what we do, but you don't really have control over your neurotransmitters and you can't stop anticipating things or getting excited about things. And making these changes in your life isn't healing because it's resetting your dopamine pathways or whatever because 
that's not how brains work. Also, more generally, you can't shame yourself out of liking something or being interested in something. Instead, you just feel more like you need to hide that thing. You feel embarrassed about enjoying that thing and it makes you hate yourself, and you will always keep coming back to it. You'll just feel terrible about it. If something that you enjoy is actually genuinely harmful to you, for example, I can't talk about this from like a drug standpoint because I'm too disabled for that, but I really love mac and cheese and I am fairly allergic to most of the ingredients and I know that there's options to make allergen-friendly mac and cheese, but it's not worth it. They're just not as good. It's it's not worth it. The best thing for me that has made me stop eating the thing that I'm allergic to is realize why it's not actually rewarding for me. In this case, it makes me sick. In the sense of doom scrolling for hours on end on my phone, that gives me a major headache and makes me feel weird for the rest of the day. And then I use that knowledge to change my behaviors. Not this is bad and I shouldn't be doing this, but this makes me not feel good and I want to feel good and so I'm gonna do something else. And then replace it with other behaviors like going on a walk or reading a book. The idea of dopamine fasting isn't technically super wrong or super bad. I mean, well, okay. Fasting for a bit as a cleanse and then coming back to something just means the whole time you're fasting you're thinking about what it would be like to go back to that thing, so it's better to just kind of make permanent lifestyle changes. But like the idea of taking things slower and watching what you do and how you spend your time and energy and doing what you want to do are not bad ideas because as humans in a world of late stage capitalism with a 24 hour news cycle where we are convinced we need to monetize our hobbies and do a gazillion jobs that wants to get by, we are all constantly overstimulated and stressed because that is the nature of the world that we live in. And we should be conscious of that and work on how to cope with it and take better care of ourselves because that is important for survival. But the discussion of dopamine within that is both wrong and also actively harmful because at the end of the day it causes more shame, it further villainizes a whole lot of things, it prevents people from understanding their struggles in ways that can get them options for genuine fact-based support, and it's also just blatantly wrong. That's not how brains work, that's not how neurotransmitters work, that's not how people work. Please do not repackage your own moral opinions as science with no actual understanding of or basis on science. You look silly. At the end of the day, if y'all been here for a while, you know where I'm going with this, but like, think critically. Um, <laughs> nothing is ever solely biology or solely environment. It's always a combo of the two, and it's always way more nuanced and messy than anybody wants it to be, because we as humans like to have solid answers for things that do not have solid answers. It makes us feel like we're in control, but it's also unhelpful because nuance and gray areas are where all of the answers actually lie. And while social media is a wonderful tool for disseminating information and care for minority groups, it is also not the most reliable of resources and maybe don't 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 do a dopamine fast. You don't you're not blowing out your dopamine receptors by eating a donut. You're fine. Like enjoy your donut. Have a good time. I don't know why I have donuts on the brain. I'm so sorry, but if you want to learn more about this topic, again I've linked my sources below. If you want tips on how to read research papers critically, I have a video about that which I will link above. Um let me know what weird pseudoscientific social media trend you want me to talk about next in the comments, because I enjoy doing this. Also, no hate to any of the creators who talk about this stuff. It's such a prevailing idea that like it makes sense that a lot of people will talk about it and think they're being genuinely helpful. Um, and again, the ideas of it are helpful, it's just the way that they're packaged. Anyway, I'm gonna leave it here. I know this is shorter than my usual content, but I needed a break. Um, I needed to do a little something different, and that's all I got. So, as always, thank you for listening, thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over, and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.